Hi, welcome to the ABCD Reproduction Course. I'm Dave Kennedy. I'm a professor of psychiatry at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and I'm super excited to join Angie in leading this educational effort. I have the pleasure and honor of leading the Repronym team in this initiative. Repronym is the Center for Reproducible Neuroimaging Computation, a NIBIB funded biomedical technology research center whose mission is to improve the reproducibility of neuroimaging science and extend the value of our national investment in neuroimaging research while making the process easier and more efficient for investigators. There already has been a substantial investment in developing the infrastructure for data and software sharing, but the majority of our neuroimaging publications do not utilize this infrastructure, in part because working with these infrastructures into the routine analysis workflow is still felt to be too time consuming and inefficient. Repronym's goal, therefore, is to continue to lower the barriers to routine adoption of the best practices in reproducible neuroimaging, completing this last mile problem for the typical neuroimaging researcher. The learning objectives of this lecture are to help our listeners be aware of the existence of a reproducibility problem, to be aware of some of the causes of this reproducibility problem, to be introduced to some of the general guidelines about how you can reduce the reproducibility problem in your own work, and to foreshadow some of the tools and resources that you will learn about in this course that will help you become more efficient and less irreproducible in your own work. Now, I don't want to belabor the reproducibility problem. It's been talked about and published about in all sorts of uh, different contexts. But I do want to remind ourselves the reproducibility problem costs all sorts of people, all sorts of things. Uh, on the one hand, it costs our research investment in its inefficiencies in trying to come up with true biological findings that are biologically meaningful. And it costs our patients and subjects who suffer with various issues to which neuroimaging is being applied. So it's really for all of these purposes that we really need to make sure that we're using our research investment dollar as wisely as possible. The fields of neuroimaging, and while I'm picking on neuroimaging here, this is not exclusive to neuroimaging, has you know, had 20, 25, 30 years of lots and lots of research efforts. Gobs of money have been spent you know, doing neuroimaging studies, uh, but gobs of papers have been uh, published you know, in the areas of neuroimaging applications. But yet to date, we really don't have any, uh, in mental health you know, areas, very many significant you know, improvements in the outcomes of people with mental health due to the neuroimaging you know, research. A patient seeing their child psychiatrist with autism has about the same outcome you know, today as they did you know, 25 years ago before this large investment in neuroimaging you know, or you know, genetics and other things. So this uh, kind of led uh, Tom Insel and uh, colleagues at the uh, National Institute of Mental Health to lament that you know, we have seen in the psychiatric area at least a profusion of statistically significant but minimally differentiating biological findings. These approximate replication of which you know, neither confirms nor refutes them. So in short, while the neuroimaging research enterprise has been great for the publisher, uh, publish, uh, the authors of publications, it has really been less beneficial to the patients to which they're trying to, to assist. And so this you know, is caused by a number of problems, uh, some of which is low power, some of which is exactly what diagnostic or you know, behavioral target we're after, but also part of it has to do with sort of incomplete methods description and results description and the inability from the published you know, entity to really assess you know, reproducibility and the generalization of, of reported you know, findings. The term reproducibility uh, can be used in different contexts, and so I want to make sure to take a minute to uh, define some of what you know, I like to use in the case of the reprenim approach. So the question of reproduce what? You know, to some extent, we have a publication itself and we may want to reproduce in the sense of re-executing a particular result. If a publication says in this data set, the free surfer volume of the hippocampus is 203 millimeters larger in the boys than in the girls, well, we'd like to be able to re-execute and verify and reproduce that particular finding. That would be interesting, although not very biologically meaningful. 
as importantly, or even more importantly, we'd like to be able to reproduce in this context of generalizing the claim that was made in that publication. Uh, in this case, the claim is that hippocampi are larger in boys than in girls. The reproonym position you know, is that in order to explore generalization you know, efficiently, we really have to have both of these types of uh, procedures in place. We need application level re-executability so that we can verify and then explore uh, implicitly the generalization of a claim by using that re-executable framework and exp expanding it across different data sets, across different analytic approaches you know, that are designed to explore that the generalization of that particular finding. In terms of framing uh, our presentation, we like to think about the cornerstone of reproducible research being transparency. And in sort of brief high level terms, transparency is achieved through annotating and sharing precisely what operations were performed on what data in a fashion that could potentially be re-executed by someone else in an attempt to replicate and ultimately document the generalizability of the original finding. This kind of leads us to an aspirational goal that we'll talk more about you know, later in the course about this idea of the re-executable publication, the ReproPub. Again, we're sort of striving towards getting to a publication that is completely re-executable in that you know, all of the elements are described and all the elements are published. So that the generalization of that uh, observation can be more precisely examined. So let's work through an example of an attempt to verify the reproducibility of a specific finding. This example is provided by a paper by Anne Lefebvre and colleagues back in 2015. This example pertains to the claim that the corpus callosum is smaller in subjects with autism compared to typically developing control subjects. A substantial number of publications exist with observations that support this claim. A meta-analysis of the prior literature reported here confirms a significant decrease with 11 of the 17 publications included reporting a significant effect. The standardized effect size was moderate at negative 0.05, I'm sorry, at negative 0.5, indicating the means of the autistic and typical groups were separated by about half the standard deviation of the measure. Great, done. This is settled science. The observation is reproducible and the claim has been generalized to different subject populations and analysis methods. Therefore, one would expect that it would be a relatively easy finding to replicate if a new, large database happened to become available. Enter the Autism Brain Image Data Exchange, or ABIDE, with over 1,000 autism and typical subjects collected from numerous sites, including structural and resting state imaging, and made freely available. Simply pick the data, pick an analysis tool, in this case, FreeSurfer 5.1, do some quality assurance in the raw and resulting data, and run the statistical test of corpus callosum volume as a function of diagnosis. This analysis resulted in a data set of 694 subjects, 328 with autism, and 366 controls. Running this statistical analysis identifies first, a robust site effect, as expected, second, a robust age effect, as expected, third, a robust sex effect, also as expected, and what? No effect of diagnosis. But why? This was supposed to have been a no-brainer. Well, the first suspect is power. The mega-analysis of the Abide dataset is well-powered to detect a standardized effect of 0.5. In fact, it had 99% power to detect differences of 0.3 standard deviations. By contrast, amongst the publications in the meta-analysis, the highest power to detect this effect size was only 36% and went down from there. The numbers of subjects per study in the meta-analysis ranged from 20 to 115, indicating that the literature the meta-analysis was based on was woefully underpowered for an effect of the reported size and could well be adversely affected by publication bias. A second explanation explored in this article was related to higher order interaction effects Specifically, the authors noted, quote, nonlinear variations in corpus callosum size relative to the brain volume, unquote. 
and the observation that IQ related both to brain volume and diagnosis. So, while something's definitely going on, what's going on may be a much more complex interplay between IQ, diagnosis, overall brain volume, and the corpus callosum. Disentangling these higher order relationships was well beyond the analytic power of the individually underpowered study. And in the revised words of the notorious BIG, and if you don't know, now you still don't know. So that illustration just uh, reminds us that we have to be careful about what we think you know, has been concluded from the literature, uh, especially when the literature itself is historically made up of you know, relatively small studies. So the point here is when it comes to examining the, or the, the examining the re-execution or the generalizability of observations and claims, it turns out that everything in the research process matters. Data analysis choices as basic as what operating system you're running your analysis on matters. Uh, and an example here, one can look at, you know, uh, the running of, you know, brain volumes using Cell, the FIMRIB software library uh, in different operating systems, Mac OS X and Ubuntu. Uh, you see that the same version of the software run on the same data, right? Uh, a variety of you know, volumetric differences on a you know, per subject basis. In this case, we're looking at you know, left accumbent and left caudate uh, and left amygdala and the numeric differences that the only different numeric differences in the selection of operating system you know, on the same version. Similarly, how much data you have matters. Uh, and an example, looking at the uh, hippocampus uh, sex effect between males and females. Uh, if you thought about this question back in 2005, one of the largest data sets you might have had uh, access to is the pediatric, uh, the NIH uh, pediatric uh, database, uh, 325 subjects. If you look at that data for a sex effect uh, of uh, hippocampal volume, uh, you would not you know, observe that. Come uh, 2011, where the PING data becomes released, PING is the Pediatric Imaging Neurocognition and Genetics uh, Study, which I'll use in a couple other examples as we go along. Uh, that had you know, 1,200 uh, subjects. When you pool this with the PEDS data and begin to look at you know, the sex effect of hippocampal volume, you begin to see a significant effect. And then you know, later on when Abide and other uh, uh, resources become available and you add this, that, you know, a sex effect, you know, begins to stabilize and, and stay significant. So again, it's not that the sex effect, you know, wasn't present in the PEDS data. It's just that, you know, it was a small enough number of, of subjects to not really be able to detect, you know, the presence of that effect, you know, significantly. So again, and small effects, we need large data sets in order to identify these uh, effects, you know, uh, consistently. To dig a little deeper into this, we know that there is a direct relationship between effect size and the number of subjects needed in order to observe that effect, in other words, the power. But we don't always have a good intuition about how many subjects are needed to see an effect of a certain size. In this example, we look at the sex effect upon the hippocampus volume in the PING dataset. When we use the full dataset of about 1,200 subjects, we see a significant sex effect of about 200 cubic millimeters. This effect is small with a standardized effect size of about 0.15. We now look at the detectability of this effect as a function of the number of subjects. We do this by subsampling the PING dataset to different target study sizes. Each open blue circle on this plot represents a different subsample and the sex effect observed. So, for example, looking at the sample size of 125, each of the blue circle circles here represent a different resampling of 125, 125 subjects from the pool of 1,200 cases. Over the course of 10,000 resampling trials, we get the observed distribution of the estimate of the effect at this sample size. This distribution of sex effects using the sample size of 125 ranged from negative 100 to positive 700 cubic millimeters and indicates a large number of samples where the observed effect is in the opposite direction of the nominal true effect. 
things get worse with smaller and smaller sample sizes, and all of the samples do not fall onto the correct side of the distribution until about a sample size of 250 subjects. And it is about a sample size of 500 subjects before the distribution of results becomes fairly stabilized. The key variables we need to keep in mind include the size of the biological effect that we're looking for and the variance of the measurement system we are using. When we are searching for small effects, we need large sample sizes and analyses with tight variances. When we design an analysis, we select specific software tools in order to generate the desired metrics. But do all software tools that generate a specific type of measurement generate the same results? The short answer is no. In this example, we look at two tools that measure properties of the cerebral cortex. cortex. In this case, the volume of a gyral region, the left caudal anterior cingulate cortex. We look at two tools for doing this, free surfer and ants. And within FreeSurfer, we look at two versions of the tool, version 5.1 and 5.3. We again use the Abide dataset with over 800 subjects who have passed through these three analyses. In the middle of the bottom row here, we see the relationship of this volume measured using FreeSurfer 5.1 versus 5.3. This shows a pretty tight correlation between these measures aligned with the line of identity. By contrast, in the left panel of this bottom row, we see the relationship between FreeSurfer 5.3 and ANTS. While these measures are statistically correlated, there is a substantial dispersion between these measures, and the line of regression falls well off the line of unity. This indicates systematic differences between the outputs of these two tools with respect to this measure. I'm not going to say anything about which is righter or wronger, but rather that it matters which tool is being used and thus the reproducibility of a finding within a tool may not represent the generalizability of that type of finding across different tools measuring nominally the same feature, but where these tools themselves may not be in agreement. When studies disagree, it is critical to find out why, and not just to wish the differences away haphazardly due to vague methodological or sampling differences. So the ramification of this becomes uh, apparent uh, when we think about uh, Siegel's law. A person with one watch knows what time it is. And my one watch example here is, you know, free surfer 5.3, looking at the abide data, looking for uh, autism of that, and sort of rank ordering you know, all of the uh, the significance of the diagnostic effect in this data and we identify a number of regions, you know, that, uh, you know, meet, you know, sort of statistical, st statistical significance for difference. One watch, I know what time it is. I know what structures are, you know, showing differences, you know, with this uh, diagnosis. The second sentence of Siegel's law is, but a person with two watches is never sure. And again, in this example, that second watch, you know, is the ants. Data, same data, same diagnoses, just a different tool looking at volumetric observations, and we get a different selection of you know, regions that are significantly different between those two diagnostic groups. So exactly what paper you would write and what conclusions and interpretation you would make about that data depends, you know, not on that you're measuring volume of you know cortical parcellation regions, but what tool you're using you know, for those, those volumes. Exactly what statistical test you use can also affect the nature, interpretation, and size of the effect you identify. Here, we are again using ping data, n of approximately 1,200 subjects, and looking at the sex effect in the hippocampal volume. In the plots that I show, each statistical test that I run will be represented as a blue circle. I'm plotting the circle on the x-axis to represent the observed effect size, and the y-axis to represent the R-squared of the model, in other words, the amount of variance explained. Higher R-squared represents better models. The x-axis whiskers are the 95% confidence interval for the effect size. If that interval touches the zero for effect size, that test will be deemed not significant. In addition 
to looking at the sex effect in the hippocampal volume, there are a number of other covariates I could use in the model. In this example, I also have for each subject the age, sight, socioeconomic status, total brain volume, and genetic ancestry factor. With these five covariates, we can generate 32 different unique statistical models by permuting the combinations of covariates included. Half of these models, for example, will not include the total brain volume covariate. The cluster of 16 models shown in the circled region to the lower right of the plot are these models without the total brain volume. The base model, sex with no covariates, is the lowest circle in this cluster, demonstrating a significant effect of about 650 cubic millimeters, but relatively low amount of total variance explained at 0 0.17. The rest of the models that don't include total brain volume show a similar effect size, but including these covariates yields models that better explain the overall variance observed. The upper circled cluster of models are the 16 models that do include the total brain volume as a covariate. We see a dramatic jump in the variance explained towards 0 0.5 and a diminution of the effect size to something in the 0 to 300 cubic millimeter range. The fact that including total brain volume in the model has a substantial effect is due to the fact that the total brain volume itself has a substantial sex effect. Covarying for this reduces, but probably does not eliminate a sex effect in the hippocampus. The base model plus only the total brain volume is the lowest model in this cluster, showing a significant effect size of about 200 cubic millimeters. And as before, adding more of the covariates yields models that better explain the overall variance. But now we see that these additional covariates can also have a more dramatic effect on the effect size estimate itself. Indeed, some of these models yield non-significant re results for the sex effect. So even in this large data set, depending on the statistical model, the presence of a sex effect in the volume of the hippocampus is still not completely resolved. Here I will not address the question of right model, only that model matters. The issue of model selection will be addressed in a number of the lectures in this course. So having spent a few moments uh, talking about the problems, um, we come to a quick realization that doing truly reproducible neuroimaging research is hard. There are so many things you have to do in order to get it right. Part of the purpose of this course is to uh, introduce you, know, you to a set of uh, comprehensive set of tools and practices that are designed to advance the reproducibility of each of these critical stages of the neuroimaging research progress, uh, process. By way of trying to provide a high level guide to what uh, Repronym is attempting to accomplish, let's consider the following uh, example. Here, we're looking at a traditional publication uh, that is looking at the corpus callosum volume uh, as a function of total brain volume. Uh, so here we see the original published report, corpus callosum you know, area versus total brain volume and a nice you know, correlation. That is published as a, gra as a graphic in a PDF document and yes, the text reports, you know, what tool they use, the text reports, you know, what the statistics of this are, but, you know, it's uh, all at a very kind of descriptive, you know, level. In the Repronym way, a Repronym publication, yes, you know, looks very similar. And this again is, you know, uh, using FreeSurfer to develop a corpus callosum volumes to uh, apply that to the abide and the ADHD you know, 200 you know, data set where typical cortical, where typical corpus callosum volume as a function of uh, brain volume can be explored. This is different data than the original, but this uh, again confirms, uh, generalizes you know, that original finding of brain volume and corpus callosum you know, being you know, associated. But what's different than a traditional publication is that each point in this graph knows, knows who the subject was that created it. The, that measure of a volume 
that is plotted there knows what you know the brain volume is, knows what the corpus callosum volume is, knows the subject you know that that was uh, generated from, and hence the demographics and clinical variables. That point knows what MRI scan generated it, and the scanner details, the acquisition, and you know where that you know, image you know lives, and can be found. That point knows what workflow generated it, what software, what hardware you know, were used to generate that particular volume. That point knows where that measure fits into the constellation of all the sort of measures that could be made. It's a volume, it's a corpus callosum. Uh, and these are all you know, concepts that live in the context of you know, volume versus thicknesses versus uh, you know, surface areas or corpus callosum versus white matter versus you know brain volume. So all these are related to each other. And so the point itself you know, is a representation in the reprenim version of the world that is connected to all these different representations about that you know, observation. And just as an example, you know, the workflow that generated that particular you know, point you know, you know, is a containerized workflow, and we'll talk about that in the course, the co course of the course. Uh, that container lives at a place that is indexed and findable by others. So that that particular you know, set of analysis routines you know, could be downloaded and run by other individuals. So the workflow that ge generated is connected to that point and that workflow is accessible to others. So that means that this particular point could be regenerated by anyone, anyone who has access to that container uh, and the execution services needed and that particular uh, data set that was used. So that's you know, good from the re-executability point of view that anyone should be able to re-execute that point and all the other points as well. But it's also good from the generalizability point of view, because if you want to add new data to this, you want to add new data that's been processed and handled in the identical fashion. So given new data that the description of how this point was generated can enough information so that an identical process can be formed, performed you know, on new data. This data point is also fair in the sense that it is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Findable in the sense that we have a you know, pool of these data points that are uh, generated from publicly accessible data and uh, interoperable and uh, accessible via the annotation you know, that is provided for that point using the neuroimaging data model uh, markup. And again, these are all details that will be uh, elucidated or, or spelled out more clearly for you all in, in future lectures, but just trying to you know, give a general you know, overview here of what we're trying to accomplish. Like all reprenim objects, the statistical treatment of this data is also fair. The statistical software can be captured in a containerized environment. The statistical analysis script can be generated under version control, so the, the analyses actually used in this example can be tagged to this result. The statistical result itself can be shared and semantically annotated with the details of the test, facilitating the discovery of the results and claims and the content that went into it. This supports both re-executability of the original and facilitates generalization of the approach to other data and statistical treatments in a structured fashion. So as I said, doing truly reproducible neuroimaging research is hard. There are so many things you have to do to get it right. Reprenim has also tried to stratify the reproducibility processes into individual components that each are less hard and each can be adopted individually and each together contribute to the overall reproducibility of the research effort. The reprenim platform, so to speak, is an effective virtual path through each of these components. So at a high level, the five steps to more reproducible neuroimaging research mantra that uh, reprenim you know, tends to, to push you know, is really divided into steps that have to do with study design, steps that have to do with data collection, steps that have to do with data processing, steps that have to do with statistical analysis, steps that have to do with publication. 
to do all of these things right and go straight from you know, whatever you were doing you know, last year or your last publication into all of this, that's really hard. Getting all of these things you know, right uh, and improved and, and done better you know, is really hard. So we're trying to make sure that you know, we can break the problem into small enough pieces that you, know, you can find a piece in your next publication to do something a little bit more you know, reproducible than your prior publication. Some of these are relatively easy and thus are relatively low hanging fruit you know, to adopt. Some of these can be picked up you know, sort of midstream, you know, even if you've finished all your design and collection but are still in your processing, some of these can be adopted you know, later on. So you don't have to start you know, from the beginning with only applying these types of principles to, to new studies. Um, and some of these you know, get hard and uh, become more challenging to do. But as you work your way up through the easier ones, uh, you can you know, prepare yourself you know, mentally to try to address some of the, the more complex ones. There are many tools, I'm not gonna read these for you, but many of these tools are the types of tools you'll hear about over the course you know, of this, uh, uh, this course. Uh, and you know, they're designed you know, to try to make different elements of these you know, phases of your, reproduce, of your neuroimaging research process you know, more, more executable. We can go through, at a high level, the overview of these step concepts. Step one is the study designs phase. Make sure to plan for reproducibility, or as Yarek likes to say, make your project, quote, reproducible by design, unquote. This includes building shareability into the consent, planning your data management and data annotation from the get-go, pre-registering the elements of your data analysis plan that are specifically hypothesis testing or replications of prior studies. Pre-registration is a newer concept, so it's important to get folks to think about this more upfront. The ABCD data exploration portal that Wes Thompson will talk about tries to promote pre-registration. In shared data resources, such as ABCD, the handling of corrections for multiple comparison is a community task, not just a specific lab or individual task. And pre-registration is one way to help control for and count planned comparisons. Pre-registration does not limit exploratory and discovery analysis, but tries to help make sure the community is clearer in the reporting of these types of endeavors. In step two, the data collection step, we emphasize the use of standards and the tools to get your data into standards as soon as possible in the process. Moving data into standards early on is a good place to do initial quality control and compliance checking of the protocol, and to catch and annotate or correct problems and deviations early on. Everything should be done using version control. At this data collection step, this includes your protocols and each of your inquired imaging, behavioral, clinical, demographic, etc. data types. Set up procedures to fully annotate your data now as you collect if you didn't do that in the study design phase above. In the data processing domain, uh, really trying to be more attentive to the high level you know, sort of modularization of the data processing and high level steps, documenting clearly the software and computational environments, uh, using version control. And now in this case, we mean version control for everything, not just software when we think of it you know, more traditionally, but the scripts you write, the data you have, the containers you run, are all subject to the ability to use version control uh, uh, systems. Uh, and annotation applies here to the extent that you know, not, uh, the results of your analyses you know, should be annotated so that a volume from a free surfer or a uh, surface area from an ANTS or a, a uh, statistical map from an SS FSL analysis, et cetera, all sort of represent you know, in a standard fashion the outputs of those uh, data processing steps. Step four pertains to the statistical analysis. Here again, planning is key, and identifying the goals of your study is critical. J.P. Pauline, later in this course, will remind you that if you wait until now in the analysis steps, i.e. after design, collection, and processing, to involve your statistical collaborators, they will be able to tell you what your study will die from, but they may not be able to revive it at this point. Choose your tools carefully and version control your analysis scripts. One of your, as one of your end goals of your study is to see if it generalizes, now is a chance to begin to look at this. If possible, 
check to see if your results are stable relative to any arbitrary -ish parameters you may have selected, i.e. spatial smoothing. If your results don't care, great. Reporting this may be beneficial. If your results do care, it's better to introduce this aspect of the interpretation yourself rather than wait for it to be discovered by others. It's an opportunity to discuss what sensitivities to specific parameters mean in the context of the analysis technology or the underlying biology. Remember, statistics are hard. Continue your education. There are lots of resources available. Step five is publish. Or is it share? Or it doesn't really matter. The point is to be able to convey to others the complete description of what you've done in your scientific study. In the traditional manuscript side of things, we've become quite used to, on the one hand, peer-reviewed publications, and on the other hand, non-peer-reviewed preprints. The main difference between the publication and the preprint is the peer review process and the stamp of acceptance by a journal and then the indexing and discovery that that certification affords. Both publication and preprints, i.e. peer-reviewed or non-peer-reviewed, are ways to disseminate one's work to the community. The discovery, citability, in order to attribute what one has done relative to others, and credit, to receive credit for what you've done, is enhanced through the peer review journal process. But as we've been been discussing, the scientific process that generates the study is much more than some resulting descriptive PDF of the study and findings. It's all the things that went into the study, the protocol, the raw data, the processing scripts and software, the computational environment, the derived results, the statistical results and the claims. Each of these are research objects in their own right that comprise the study. Each of these objects involve the work and labor of researchers and their teams. Each of these are potentially reusable. Each of these deserve attribution if reused. And for each of these, the authors, creators, deserve credit. Each of them should be treated as first-class objects of the scientific process. In other words, each should be published. Like the peer-reviewed paper versus non-peer-reviewed preprint for the written word, there's a similar preprint, postprint system available for these other research objects as well. For example, one could preprint data to a host like Open Neuro or Nitric. It is shared and it's available to others, but it's not necessarily peer-reviewed or certified in any way. One can take that shared data and then with the appropriate descriptive documentation, submit that data to a data publication at journals such as Nature's Scientific Data or Neuroinformatics for peer review and independent certification of the data, the description, and its accessibility. A similar pathway can be defined for software from a GitHub preprint to a Journal of Open Scientific Software publication, for example, uh, that follows that same analogy. So in this step, what we are advocating for and supporting is to prepare each of your research objects as if you are going to share or publish them. Because even if you don't, your collaborators and your future self will be more efficient if you do. Use standards and annotation so that your works are fair and share all the raw data, the derived data, scripts, containers, software, protocols, etc. So sort of the high level summary of that set of steps you know, that we you know, went through and sort of focusing on this concept of annotating and sharing precisely what operations were performed on what data, the common themes you know, that wove through those steps that we just went through is version control, you know, everything, so that you, you know, know what you did and when and why you changed what you did. And this applies to data, scripts, software, containers, protocols, et cetera, so the whole kit and caboodle of the uh, research enterprise. Annotate everything uh, so that others can understand and reuse more easily your products. Uh, this includes annotation of the raw data, annotation of the derived results. Use standards whenever you can so that others can access what you've done more easily and so that you don't have to spend the rest of your future you know, describing what you did you know, when other people access your shared materials. Use containers for data processing when you can. 
so that others can actually do exactly what you did. And again, details of this will be forthcoming in future of the lectures in, in this course. Uh, and publish, i.e. share everything so that others can get access to the research elements that went into your particular observation. So ultimately, I hope to have provided you with a high-level introduction and background to the reproducibility problem, some of its causes, and some of the things that you might be able to do to improve the re-executability of your future studies so that they more, may more easily fit into the greater scientific enterprise and support the systematic exploration of their generalizability. Lots of individuals and lots of other initiatives are represented in the reprenum efforts, and you will hear from a number of these folks throughout this course. Each week, you will be exposed to both ABCD-ish and reprenimish content, and these parallel curricula are designed to establish a fundamental baseline knowledge about these two programs. We have 13 weeks and two initiatives per week, but rest assured that we do not yet need you all to be experts in all 26 of these ABCD data and reproducibility analysis domains. Many of our trainees will already have had skills in some to many of these areas, but our expectation is that few will be skilled in all of these topics. So our objective is to bring everyone up to a basic competency in each of these areas. Thank you for your enthusiasm for this course. We wish you all the best of luck with the curriculum, and I and the entire team here are here to help make this all happen for you.